Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A, we'll look at how artificial intelligence is being used as a tool to treat diseases of the brain. We used it to distinguish different types of inputs to a particular brain area in an automated fashion. And that's the important part about artificial intelligence is that it's an algorithm. And what this algorithm reveals is that there's many different types of responses. It's a whole set of responses that describe the much more complex dynamics in the brain or the processes in the brain, and that can actually help patients and help distinguish different types of networks. Today, we'll look at how artificial intelligence is helping improve devices and surgical techniques in deep brain stimulation. That's a surgical procedure that involves implanting electrodes in certain areas of the brain. These electrodes produce electrical impulses that can regulate abnormal impulses. For the therapies that we deliver, usually the only symptoms that patients will have will be improvement and the abnormal symptoms that they have for their disease. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm your host, Dr. Helena Gazelka. For people with epilepsy and movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, electrical stimulation of the brain can be part of their treatment, believe it or not. The hope is in the future that electrical stimulation may help people with psychiatric illnesses and direct brain injuries, such as stroke as well. But understanding how brain networks interact with each other is complicated. So Mayo Clinic and Google Research are using artificial intelligence to improve brain stimulation devices to treat disease. Here to discuss this interesting topic with us today are Mayo Clinic researchers, neurosurgeon Dr. Kai Miller and biomedical engineer Dr. Dora Hermes. Thanks for being here today, Kai and Dora. Thank you for having us. It's Thank an you honor. for having us. What a fascinating topic to talk about, but maybe we should just start, Kai, with what is a brain stimulation device? Many of the diseases that we think about as neurological diseases are diseases of circuitry in the brain. So rather than coming from just one place in the brain, there are several different places in the brain that interact, and the normal ways that they interact with one another are disrupted in disease. And one way we can interact with those circuits in order to have patients have improvement in their symptoms is to put electrical stimulation devices into specific nodes in these interacting circuits and deliver electrical stimulation that shuts down part or all of the function of that given node. Some diseases that we treat for this are um, things people will be familiar with, like Parkinson's disease, where there uh, are tremors and abnormal um, electrical sign signatures that accompany those tremors, and also um, things like essential tremor, Tourette's, um, and uh, epilepsy. So as a neurosurgeon here at Mayo, I treat um, movement disorders like essential tremor, um, Parkinson's disease, and Tourette's, but also um, epilepsy quite a bit. And we use electrical stimulation for both of these. And people may be familiar with the term deep brain stimulation, and that is the most common type of electrical stimulation that we do. So Kai, are you basically using electricity or electrical stimulation to stop um, activity that shouldn't be occurring in the brain? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, it sounds like a simple question that you've asked, but it's actually uh, something that's not well understood. So when we deliver electrical stimulation, we can um, do it in different ways. So we know that when we stimulate, for example, at um, 30 hertz, which is one electrical impulse every, uh, or 30 electrical impulses per second, um, compared with 100 electrical impulses per second, we can get actually symptoms being worse in the 30 hertz case versus better in the 100 hertz case. And there's some mixture of uh, exciting these cells and having them uh, send impulses elsewhere versus shutting the activity of these populations of cells in the brain down. And the most common type of thing that we do now is high frequency electrical stimulation. So at something like 100 to 130 Hertz. And that's really mimicking uh, what we would do if we, if we made a lesion or destroyed that part of the brain, but it, we turn it on and off. And we can actually give it a partial effect. Um, so it has the effect of a part, like a partial injury to that part of the brain, which helps uh, reestablish normality in that circuit uh, that's happened from disease states, maybe even elsewhere in the brain. And so it's so a sim simple question, I know, an important question that you've asked, but the answer is, is that there, there is no simple answer. 
<laughs> How did I know you were going to say that? Kai, can, can um, patients feel when their brain is being stimulated? Yeah. Um, in some cases they can, in other cases they can't. Uh, I mean, for example, for example, in, um, if you stimulate areas of the brain involved with movement or sensation, they'll feel sometimes changes in the way that they move, or they'll feel abnormal sensation. And for the case of some of the surgeries that we do, actually, we do surgery with the patients awake so we can test for abnormal sensations and that kind of thing. Um, for the therapies that we deliver for epilepsy and also for movement disorders, usually the only symptoms that patients will have will be improvement and the uh, abnormal symptoms that they have for their disease. So let's get on to what's new about this. Dora, what is artificial intelligence or AI and what does it have to do with brain stimulation? So um, artificial intelligence is a set of tools, um, a set of mathematical and statistical tools that we can use to, um, to basically distinguish different types, for, in this case, different types of brain measurements, or we can decode, we can label those automatically in an automatic fashion. So in, there's a large, you know, it's a, it's a broad field. There's a lot we can do with artificial intelligence or machine learning tools. Um, and in this case, um, we used it to, um, to distinguish different types of inputs to a particular brain area in an automated fashion. And that's the, uh, the, um, the important part about artificial intelligence is that's an algorithm basically a, a mathematical computation that works on its own. So that's the important part about it here. So it sounds smart. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> yes, you can basically, and that's why it, it, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be developed with, you know, with the insights of neurosurgeons, especially such that it will actually be interpretable, that the outputs are interpretable, and it's not just a black box that you're, um, where you're labeling something that you don't know about, but you're actually uh, getting some output back that fit, that matches your data and that describes the data in a, in a good fashion. And so why that needs to be described, applied to brain stimulation is important. So the reason why we apply in this case an AI algorithm to brain stimulation is because previously people only looked at like a very few features when we stimulate the brain in the manner that we did in this study. So people only looked at one single type of response. And what this algorithm reveals is that there's many different types of responses. It's not just one type at one particular latency, but it's a whole set of responses that describe the much more complex dynamics in the brain or the processes in the brain. And that can actually help patients and help distinguish different types of networks. Interesting. Dora, I'm going to ask you one clarifying question, and I may be way off base. I implant spinal cord stimulators for a back pain and it provides a constant signal. There's not an alteration. Is the point of the algorithm that the, and the learning part of this, that the treatment can change in response to what's going on in the brain, or am I misunderstanding? So in this case, it doesn't, um, the, the, the stimulation doesn't respond, doesn't change in terms of, doesn't change. It is constant. It's the same type of amplitude. It's a single pulse. Okay. So what we did, so it's actually a really elegant way to probe brain networks because we apply a very brief pulse of um, electrical stimulation. And what coming back to the previous question about whether patients feel it, they generally don't in this case. It's generally, it's so short and so small that they generally don't feel it. But the good thing is that since we sent a single pulse into the brain, it has a large effect on different networks and it affects different networks in different ways. And that's what the algorithm distinguishes. It helps us tease apart those different networks to better understand which areas to probe in order to help develop new therapies. That is really fascinating. So how, how do you apply this uh, every day in your practice, Kai? And how would an individual know if they might, a patient know if they might be a candidate for this type of therapy? Well, we're starting to have the ability to deliver stimulation to um, many different brain areas. So for example, um, when deep brain stimulation started, it was really just um, one site could be stimulated at a time. And we now have, there are now clinically available 32 channel stimulation systems for the brain. And we actually implanted the first in the world here at Mayo Clinic uh, last summer. 
And if we're stimulating different areas in the brain, uh, the brain is large and complex, and we need to know if we stimulate two different areas, are these areas interacting with one another? And if so, if we're trying to decide, I, let's say I know that one particular area is important and I have two other candidate sites where I might stimulate and I want to know if one of those candidate sites is interacting with this one site that I, I know is important. So this technique would allow us to deliver short electrical impulses separated by long periods of time and then tease apart whether or not the response that they create in the site that we know is important is the same for both of those two, uh, is different for those two, and whether one is, let's say, statistically significant and the other is not. And uh, because of the uh, types of um, algorithms that are out there to naively learn or, or where the computer itself can learn by applying a set of rules, um, the algorithms that were out there prior to our study uh, didn't have the ability to leverage um, a known structure that you would, you would already have in the data. And uh, for the people that are maybe experts in the audience, that kind of thing, it's a new type of hierarchical clustering algorithm that didn't exist before. And basically, we take advantage of the fact that we, we expect that when you stimulate one brain area and measure in another, if you stimulate 10 times, that each of those stimulations should appear somewhat similar. And then if you go to a different site and stimulate 10 times, that each of those 10 should be similar. But we can actually look at shared structure between, let's say, the 10 impulses produced uh, by stimulating one site and the 10 impulses in another site and look at similarities and differences algorithmically to tease apart um, both statistical significance and also the um, dynamics in time of the electrical response. So patients, how, do, how does this apply to your patients? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, this is all about uh, patients. And so uh, I think that the, the easiest way that to explain it will be um, as we start to treat new diseases, um, for example, example, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, we're going to be implanting large numbers of electrodes and only some of those electrodes will be the places that we deliver therapy to. And we need to have a method to probe the network of regions that we've implanted um, and come away with concrete a concrete statement about how different nodes in that network are interacting with one another. And so this provides a new important diagnostic tool to characterize those interactions so I can put in multiple stim, uh, electrodes that stimulate in multiple places at the same time or with particular um, spatial meaning across different areas of the brain and temporal meaning at different points in time patterns of stimulation um, that will treat uh, diseases that are somewhat more sophisticated and nuanced in terms of the circuit dysfunction in the brain. So things like depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, abnormal types of seizures. And uh, what this does is it gives us a new power tool to know what pairs of sites in the brain we should be stimulating together. That is really amazing. Dora, what do you see coming in the future for patients with brain disorders? So the field is shifting from seeing brain disorders um, and many brain disorders as being a disorder of one particular region compared and now they're more seeing it as a network that is abnormal. So what we need to be able to treat network type diseases, and that's the case for epilepsy, for movement disorders, that's already been long case, but also for uh, many neuropsychiatric illnesses, for example. And so we need to, in order to treat these network disorders, as Dr. Miller just described, um, we need to understand how we can probe those networks in a network style. So distinguish multiple inputs to one brain region and be able to combine those in order to modify a network rather than modify a single structure, because we are now starting to understand better that even epilepsy doesn't always come from one brain region. Sometimes there's a network of areas involved. And this particular method allows us to probe those networks. And then I am, have the pleasure to work, be able to work with the neurosurgeons and the neurologists to then test whether network type stimulation actually improves the diseases diseases. It's very interesting. What amazing work. Much of it went above my head, but I am so thrilled that there are uh, individuals like you working on this area. Any last thoughts for our listeners, Kai? Um, I mean, I guess what I'd like to let people know is that really there is a push here at Mayo to 
um, use the uh, traditions of the institution and the large number of patients that come to us to learn new types of therapies and bring new technologies to bear here at Mayo. And that really it is a unique environment that um, we are able to work in, Dr. Hermes and I, in order to uh, work with patients that had diseases, help those patients, but also learn from those patients and apply the principles that we are able to learn from working with these patients to help future patients. And um, that it's really only by the grace of our patients that we have that we're able to develop therapies for new patients we will have in the future. And so um, I'm very grateful for the ability to work with um, the people who choose to, um, to, to do these uh, research um, uh, studies with us here at Mayo and, um, and also to be able to work with talented scientists like Dr. Hermes, who we brought here to Mayo Clinic. And allow me to say how grateful we are that both of you have uh, joined us today to discuss this exciting topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gazelka. Yeah, thank you so much for having us today. Yes, thank you. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon, Dr. Kai Miller, and biomedical engineer, Dr. Dora Hermes, for being here today to talk to us about uh, brain stimulation uh, algorithms, essentially. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts.